Hey, Reggie. It's uh, Kurt and David from fishduck.com. How you doing? Hey, is this a good time? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic, man. Well, we really appreciate you taking some time out to talk to us. Uh, I know you've spoken to both of us individually before, and we're we're really excited to be able to feature your story on, on the site and uh, kind of remind fans of uh, who you were and what you did at the, at the University of Oregon. I'm excited too. Uh, again, I've been trying to get back out there. I think this is the year, so I'm yeah. excited to get back home, so to speak. <laughs> well, yesterday was the Oregon spring game. In fact, I'm very, very sunburned from having been there, <laughs> but it's – it's quite different from what you will remember Autzen Stadium being like. We had oh, yeah. we had f- about 40,000 people at the spring game. Whoa. So I, I'm not sure if you ever played in front of 40,000 people at Autzen. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it might have been 35, I think, with something that I had back. Right. <laughs> it, felt, it felt like 100 the way you're so enthusiastic, you know? Yeah, yeah. T- t- well, you know... Regardless of how many people are there, we Oregon fans have never been short on passion. So, um, my my one question to you, though, first though, is did you ever get those videotapes in the mail? No, I didn't. Uh, matter of fact, I had the wife pulling them out this morning when I thought about you guys going to be calling me. Oh, okay. Because I, I I was wondering about it. Like I keep checking the mail. Like, nope, no tapes today. No tapes today. No tapes today. So, uh, wait, whenever you do, I I will absolutely convert those to DVD for you and send them back and and. Um, it would be fantastic if we could take that footage and combine it with the article, um, but we might have the article due before we can get the footage in hand. So that, that that's okay. That's not a big deal. We do have a couple of clips of like that. Can you name that duck and that little flashback video that you've seen? So we can use those and just some uh, some photos from your playing days. But essentially what we're trying to do is just kind of get um, a recap, and we realize we're asking you questions of things that happened a long time ago. So if, if you don't remember something, it's okay. Um, but whatever vivid memories you do have from your playing days, we'd love to get them down and compile them into a really nice, uh, a really nice profile of your playing days, as well as talk about some of your uh, teammates and just kind of that era in general of 79, 80 around Eugene and, uh, just what sort of memories you have, and wrap it up with a nice little where you know where is Reggie Ogburn now kind of thing. So so yeah, Reggie. You know, uh, well, first of all, uh, when were you in Eugene last? Uh, left out there in '82. Oh wow! I came back for short stint after leaving Canada. Oh wow. Yeah, then it's definitely going to be different for you. You know, thirty <laughs> years later, I mean, even in the last, even in the last ten years since the two thousand two Austin Stadium expansion, I mean, even then, it's just, it's it's just come so far. I mean, the locker room expansion, the indoor Mashovsky Center. I mean, you know, you will be you will be quite amazed when you come back. But what I understand the the field. The parking lot is not even the same as it was. Yeah, in fact, yeah. they've they've been uh, they've been taking away the parking, parking. lot. Yeah, it, that it's quite a disaster trying to park now because they they took the entire west uh, the entire west side west of the stadium is now either practice fields yeah. or soccer lacrosse fields as well as. Uh, the Center, uh, Casanova Center and the Mashovsky Center. So there's no parking over there at all. And east of the stadium, there's now a baseball stadium, and they're installing new lacrosse and soccer fields there as well. Yeah, and unfortunately, they really, sh- they really, sh- in my opinion, should have made those by the river, like where the uh, student recreation field is. I mean, it would have been so unique to have a riverfront baseball stadium, but instead they took away thousands of parking spots, putting the baseball stadium in, and then now the, uh, the new lacrosse field, too. The the end result is that it's very different. <laughs> it it's it's pretty swank. You you know, comparing to what you may remember of the facilities, what you trained with, and your locker room. When you go there, they'll definitely be able to give you a tour of everything, and your jaw will be on the floor. Like, man, I wish I had this stuff when I was playing. <laughs> man, I'm just excited hearing about it from you guys. Yeah, well, we we look forward to it. Uh, um, he. He told me before the Washington game is what he's coming up for. So if you, if you're coming up for a game, that's definitely <laughs> definitely that's a good one. one to do so. 
Um, so the, the first thing that I think we should get into is really, you know, what drew you to the University of Oregon to begin with, and that, you know, you played JC. Um, Rich Brooks at the time was really a new coach at Oregon, and, and Oregon through the 70s was not really a memorable uh, a very memorable time. There weren't a lot of victories. So what was it that enticed you to want to be a duck and, and come to Eugene? And what other schools were you looking at? Well, coming out of high school, um, we had went to the national champion, to the state championship. And most of my teammates got offers from, you know, big schools, uh, major uh major A schools like University of Florida, my University of Miami, Oklahoma. And being a quarterback of my stature, um, the only chances I had at that time would have been uh, Oklahoma or University of Florida that ran a, uh, some type of option uh, offense. But they had already stacked their deck and their future was already set with uh, recruits. So... I had an opportunity to go to uh, University of Cincinnati, Eastern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, East Tennessee. Um, and I, I didn't think they deserved my talents. I thought they were, I was selling for, for less of a competitive league. So all of a sudden I got a call from a guy out in California, Valencia, College of the Canyons, saying, hey, come out here. A lot of eyes to be on you. You will go to a uh, Pac-10 school. And I said, that's what I want. And I was, my mom kind of got upset because I was going so far away from home, but I decided to venture out there. And just about every school wanted me <laughs> after my two years there. And uh, the only one that, uh, only two that wanted me to play quarterback was uh, both the Ducks and the, uh, the Beavers. And after visiting both universities, I, I chose Eugene. <laughs> uh, I can understand why. <laughs> so, and uh, we had uh, Tim Duran was playing quarterback that year. I mean, I think he went five. It went five hundred the year before I, I got there. But after visiting there, seeing the uh, facilities, and the films that I saw them play, and I said, they're just a niche, they're just a niche away from being a, a winning team. And I knew I could I could contribute. So I, I decided to go to the University of Oregon. And that's what brought me to the University of Oregon. I never looked back to the East Coast uh, for the next two or three years. Well, how much of an adjustment was it coming to you, the University of Oregon and, and Eugene, Oregon, being that you were from Florida and then playing in Southern California, how long did it take to get used to the rain and, and just, uh, you know, it, it, Oregon's certainly a unique, different place. Well, my hometown is a small town in Georgia. That's where I was born. I spent most of my summers and my small, my earlier childhood in, in a country in Georgia. So being in Florida, I was never one of the, uh, the city slickers, type, so to speak. I was not really a city guy, even though I... I lived in a big city, but uh, I was very conservative and somewhat introverted. And they called me an, an amoeba a couple of times, you know, <laughs> a couple of times. So, I mean, I just wasn't very outspoken. I just chose to do the right thing. So when I visited Oregon, I saw it reminded me of the country for the most part. That's when you get outside the university, you know, and I, I liked it, that atmosphere based on that's what my my upbringing, so it wasn't too much of an adjustment. i tell you a story, though. The uh, first day of school, there was uh, a sleet of ice on the sidewalk, and I, I don't know what it does now, but uh, they had them in, a, um, in an angle. The sidewalk was in an angle, I guess, so the water and the snow can run off. And I had on some wood, wood bottom shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Dress shoes, so to speak, and... Uh, I'll never forget, my boots went up in the air like a cartoon. <laughs> I, I hit that crowd, I'll never forget that. And I went, trying to go get me some uh, 
I, them hiking boots, I, boots I see everybody wear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone's walking around with uh, big, thick jackets and and boots, and and uh, you know, coming from California and, and Georgia, what, what's this ice stuff? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm walking around with polyester pants that, that, that is running right through them. I'm like, it's time to get some jeans and dress like the Romans do. <laughs> exactly. Learn, learn how how to you know. Uh, adapt or die, I suppose, <laughs> would be the, uh, <laughs> the the phrase for that. So, um, so yeah, you came in in '79, and you know we were taking a look back through the rosters in '79, and one thing that's really interesting about the University of Oregon, and it's true, really throughout its history, going all the way back to its early days, is that even in the years when there weren't a lot of victories, there's been a lot of um, just general football knowledge that's come out of the University of Oregon. A lot of coaches have come through, their paths have led through the, the U of O in, in one way or, or another. Some absolute legends like George Seifert and John Madden and, and all sorts of different people. But you played alongside, and there were also some GAs there that went on to some rather prominent uh, uh, coaching spots, and quite a few have stuck by at the U of O. There was uh, Nick Aliotti was a GA and uh Coach Pelham and Coach Greatwood, you played alongside, and and uh, Mike Nolan, who went on to the Forty Niners, and I mean they, and yeah, I mean there's there's a lot of coaches. I mean, what what is it uh, about the University of Oregon or the way they do things that that creates such great football minds to come out of the university? First of all, it's just the level of education, uh, and, and I imagine it's still that way, but. It was all about books, uh, and I forget our teacher's uh, aid or counselor that we had, but most most of those guys that I graduated with, and, and, that, and I can't tell you I was a great student going into the University of Oregon, but I became one based on my environment. I mean, my entire offensive line, those guys, I almost great would include it. I thought they were geniuses when it came to classroom. Um, they might have not been the Proliferal, and even Mike Nolan may not be a proliferal uh, type athlete, but they had discipline and the knack of the game. I mean, Nolan, Nolan never blew assignments. He, he probably didn't run a 4 4 40 or 4 3 40 speed. He probably didn't run, the, run as fast as the, the USC and UCLA offensive linemen, but they, we did for a discipline. We practiced hard. We didn't blow assignments. Uh, we, we're a well-oiled machine, so to speak. We practice that way, uh, film sessions, and the whole nine yards. So when you get that type of coaching, and you may not be the guy that's going to be an all-world NFL player, including myself, um, you, you can go and apply, the, apply yourself to teach people because it, it's a discipline. I think all sports are discipline. Discipline. They're, they're no more than going to biology class when you're talking about sports, you know, and those guys, they, they learned the game and were just going to do their assignment. And that's what made us good. I mean, we, we didn't have, we didn't have uh, Ronnie Lott and McNeil and all that going for us, but we were disciplined, very disciplined. And that, I think that's what took those guys to the level of teaching. Well, the there there were certainly players on on those rosters though that went on to rather prolific careers. You, you look at guys like Mike Walter and Brian Hinkle and uh, uh, certainly Gary Zimmerman. I mean, there there was some talent on on those teams, and yet before you arrived, they had gone two and nine in nineteen seventy eight, and. Uh, I can't honestly think of another player that had as much of a turnaround instant impact as, as you in that the team went 2-9 and nine in 78 uh, and then back-to-back six-win seasons and then as soon as you left, they went back to a two-win season again. <laughs> so like, what happened during those two years? Oh, yeah, there was this guy named Reggie Ogburn <laughs> leading the way. <laughs> well, the shock, I guess, you know, I tell you a story Rich Brooks told me because I got kind of selfish going in my senior year thinking about NFL, mm-hmm. and I want to move the running back. And then I had a long conversation about it. He told me, I need your leadership skills. 
And, and I said that to say guys like Hinkle that was on the defense, um, Walters that played linebacker for us, uh, he, those guys rallied behind me giving every inch of juice I had. I mean, I I go out there and I was I was a little guy compared to those guys we were playing against, and uh, even my offensive line towered over me. I think they averaged something like 280, 270 or something like that on the front line, averaging about uh, 6'3", 6'4". You know, if you're talking about a 5'9 quarterback, I had to find a lot of little alleys to throw that ball. And I tell you what, when I did throw it and I was running it, nobody didn't see me until I got 10 yards down the field behind those great <laughs> Well, and it it's interesting too because uh, you know in in those days, and you know we talked about it before, but what what I really recall of um, you know very early days as a young kid, and what I've seen of footage is that the offense basically consisted of Reggie left, Reggie right, or Reggie run around in the backfield until someone gets open and just chuck it deep. <laughs> so that, that, that was pretty much the gist of it, and um, I say the story. Uh, we, Coach Whitmark, playing against Purdue after I got my knee just slightly twisted out of the Huskies game, and uh, he said, I'm just sick of this. Every time you're not up to par, you're not playing good. We look like crap. And I, uh, I didn't know if that was a compliment or he was feeling like he had his hands tied behind his back because he needed me so much. But uh, I didn't, I played hurt as much as I could because I felt like if I didn't play, I was going to let the team down. And these guys when we played Purdue, uh, coach was trying to run an offense, not surrounding me with the ball. And uh, Steve Greatwood, uh, Mathis, those guys looked at me and said, uh, hey, Reggie, that ain't working. Run it. Run it. <laughs> so I called Sprint Wright. I said, guys, I'm going to put Mark's over and give me a call and run a uh, stretch player or uh, a 44 dive or something. And I'm like, I'm sweating bullets now because I'm going to up in the not do what my coach said. <laughs> so I ran in and scored a touchdown. I got on the sideline and beat me up about it, but uh, I think he was happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, those, those guys, they they love to see me run. They, 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 and they would give their all the block. They, not too many times I got blind about it. Sure, sure, sure. Well, yeah, Reggie. You know that answers that pretty much answers the question I was about to ask. Did the did the coaches encourage you to run as often as you did, or was that just a product of necessity? But that pretty much answers that. But all in all, how do you feel that, given the fact that, like Kurt said, that we started two and nine before you, and then after you, we went back to the t only two win season? How do you feel that? You you were able to you know use your leadership of abilities to change the losing culture during your time in Eugene. A lot of it was my competitive spirit. Uh, I, I mingled with both the offense and defense alignment, and you know they were the alignment were doing snip uh, stuff, uh, stuff and snuff the you know, Copenhagen, and I adapted to that. I thought this stuff's pretty cool. I'm around here spitting with a cup in my hand and in the meeting. And I just, I didn't look at myself, even though I had the talent and I, I was getting all the publicity and, you know, and Reggie's not running good, the team's not doing good, I didn't get the big head. And I just made myself available to those guys and and made sure they knew I was a normal guy too. And that, I take a look at my career now, what, I, what, I, what I'm doing now compared to what, I was doing. I was an athlete, and I'm still managing people during the off season. Uh, during the football season, I'm, I'm dealing with uh, Pee Wee League and you know Optimus League. I just then needs to to lead people and and manage. So that that's me. That's an ingredient. That, that's that's one of the things you know they the thing in school they say are leaders born or are they made. Mm -hmm. And I'm a true believer that they're they're born. I, I just have to say that based on my own experience, because you're, you're born that way to be able to accept the responsibility to lead. I can't teach you to accept that responsibility. I can teach you leadership skills, but if you don't, if you're not born with one to accept that responsibility, you're not going to have it. Very well said. Very true too. 
Well, what's fascinating about that is the two years that you played were the only two years during a 15-year stretch that Oregon had winning seasons. So, yeah, uh, it it certainly says that that something changed in 79 and and 80. Uh, Let's take a look at some of those seasons. And uh, again, these are games that were years and years ago. So if you don't remember specifics, it's okay. But you kind of burst on the scene in 79 with that that win against Colorado in Boulder in that. Uh, I I think the headlines read. Read uh, Reggie Spall's Drew, uh, was it Drew Banks uh, debut. Yep, and well, they they had just brought in a coach who had had done uh, he'd led Oklahoma to back to back Big Eight championships, and he'd been in the NFL with the Patriots, and and so big name coach, and Colorado has high expectations, and here's little old Oregon who only won two games the previous season and haven't done much throughout the past decade. And they come into Boulder and just stomp them, thirty-three nineteen. What 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 do you remember of that particular day, that game? Just any any particular personal highlights or memories? Uh, absolutely, I, I think I can remember all uh, twenty some odd games I played. In One play in particular, I I rolled right and I cut back, and uh, see, you got to remember what I said before about when I came out of high school. So I'm playing with a chip on my shoulder because these guys didn't want me out of high school. I've got a kid named Charlie, uh, what his name? His name is Charlie playing uh, deep, uh, linebacker that went to high school. He was the underclass when I went there. But uh, all I can remember is him coming down, putting his helmet on my thigh pad, and I grabbed my, I reached to the ground and kept my balance and ran for another 20, 15 yards. So, and... And it was nice, hot, sunny, that sunny day in their stadium. We were all fired up, and I think even though they were knocking the crap out of me, uh, I just kept getting back up. I remember times where up the line came and gave me a hand and got back up, and I'm seeing stars and cows. I'm counting birds, <laughs> tweet, tweet. I mean, they're hitting. We're all, both of us are hitting, and uh, that, that was a that was a great highlight when I, when I remember cutting back and getting those extra 15 yards after he cracked me in the thigh. I didn't feel that until two days later, though. <laughs> I was so, I was so pumped. <laughs> well, what, what's fascinating is that uh, I, there was some, some bitterness there after the game because uh, Fairbanks was quoted as saying, I don't think Oregon is a very good football team, uh, but it's a football team that just beat you by – some 20 points or so. So, uh, you know, what does that say about Colorado? Um, but, but more so, you know, it seems like it, looking back through a, a lot of the quotes and a lot of things that were written and, and said, a lot of the outside perception of media and other, other teams was that Oregon wasn't a very good football team, but they just had to, had no answer. They had no way to figure out how to stop little Reggie Ogburn all the time. <laughs> No, it didn't see it. And, you know, I, that, you know when, I, when I came in and after we competed that first spring, it looked like Coach had a second playbook, Coach Brooks, because he kind of ran the same offense that they ran the year before. And Tim Durant, Durango used to run the ball as well. But I took it to the next level with my, with my fakes. Mm. Then he gave me the opportunity that he would leave me and I could read. We would leave a guy totally unblocked and I would be able to read that guy rather than give it to the fullback or keep it. And that just took us to the next level because they had no answer for that option. And we didn't look like an option team other than me. Game time, they see me running. But our our uh, the lineup that we used didn't didn't seem like it was going to be an option. So you, you had to gear up for somewhat of a he could throw the ball in this formation. He could run it. So we ran that semi-spread professional uh, uh, pro-type, pro-type uh, offensive formation. You, you, left, you left yourself vulnerable for the option. And mm. we, were able, we were able to run the option out of any formation for the most part. So that's why I got away with murder and was able to be successful as well because it was, it was very well disguised. And then if they stacked the Back in the middle, we could throw the little jump pass. We could throw the outside out. So I, you know, Rich said I could throw the ball. 
that he likes to see me run more. <laughs> well, it's an interesting season when you look o- over the roster because after that Colorado win, there was a um, the Ducks lost four out of the next five games. But then you know it looked like okay, here's another typical Oregon Ducks football season. Uh, but then you won the last four out of five, and so there was this great streak that that uh, you know the the Ducks got got rolling on. Was, was that kind of a progression that happened that year, where as Coach Brooks kind of recognized more so your skills and the ability to run option that the playbook kind of changed to where you became much more of the main offensive threat to run, and that resulted in those wins in the second half of the year. Oh yeah. Most definitely. Now, and in reference to the year before, he knew the missing part was he needed to get an offense going. I mean, that defense was second and none the year two years before. I mean, we've all like we've always had a great defense, even now to date. But prior to getting there, we had a, a decent defense that would stop people. And um, when. We came in. It was still, I was still question mark. I just beat out the guy that, that had this guy that they got from uh, high school prep, and he was supposed to Andrew Page. He was supposed to be all this. He had the size and everything, and they had Tim that was a starter. So I won the job out that spring. So going into the going into the first game, which was Colorado, I'm still question mark. So he, I guess after that, he he figured. I'm um, going to have to put this in his hand a little more. And then we went back out to Colorado, and I, I'll be quite honest with you, I got, got a little bit upset that he wasn't featuring me, so to speak. And then all of a sudden, we went through a turmoil period in the middle of the season, stopped winning, and they weren't blowouts, but they were games, they were games that we were in, and we should have won. It was like the offense kind of stumbled. Then towards the end of the year, it's like it was – I, I personally, I said, I'm taking it to the next level, and, and you kind of feed the feed the, the lion that's that's eating. And he just kept calling my number and put me in situations where I can run the ball. And then we started doing some putting some flea flickers in and stuff of that nature to counterbalance the um, everybody running to one side and started getting away with reverses. We had Coleman running. Quite a few reverses for us, you know, probably one of the fastest guys in the world at the time. And uh, we, they were smart coaches. I, they they would take a, they took my ability and my skill and got a lot of the other uh, players involved in the game. I mean, that's, that's why I just can't say it was all Reggie because I didn't feel that I had a bunch of lame guys around me because they would take everything that I was capable of doing and utilizing everybody else's skills. To, to off, offset what the defense was doing. Right. Well, and you're you're absolutely right that you look up and down that that defense, and there were certainly players that were uh, you know pro caliber. You know, we mentioned before Brian Hinkle and Mike Walter, and the guy that we didn't mention, of course, is one of the names that's always remembered from from this era, and that's Vince Goldsmith. And Vince, kind of like you, was a, a shorter guy, and maybe that's why he didn't get as as much of a look at the pros as as either of you guys did. They just looked like, oh, well, they're not tall enough to play an NFL, blah blah blah, and then done, move on. But that guy was kind of a a, a rock. <laughs> uh, I've, I've heard stories from. from I, Trust me, when I went to Canada, when I went to uh, the Rough Riders, mm-hmm. we had a preseason game against him. I, I was at Winnipeg, and he was at uh, Saskatchewan, I think it was. Mm-hmm. I, I, went to, I got drafted by Winnipeg because he was already at Saskatchewan in his second year. And uh, we threw one of these uh, Reggie Rolls semi right on 45 degree angle to throw the ball. And I looked to my left, and guess who's coming at me? <laughs> Goldsmith. And, and, and he was, this is why I never wanted to when we practice against these guys. They were great athletes, I'm telling you. They made me better, too, because I was thinking I could juke him and, and get around him, but he was so low to the ground. He didn't go for my face, and he grabbed me and tackled me for like a uh, ten yard loss. And I'm like, "Thanks a lot." <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, Vince. How, how you doing? <laughs> you <know? laughs> 
Yeah, I, yeah. I was curious if you two ever had any encounters in the CFL since you've both en- ended up there because, you know, you talk to guys from that era and Vince was the one guy that no one ever wanted to have to block. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of those guys that would put the fear of God in you and to then have to, you know, but the sometimes glad that he's a teammate and not on the opposing side. And in the CFL, suddenly you're going against him. I, I was, I was going to ask about that. Was that the only encounter that you and Vince had in the CFL or, or were there, there other times that maybe you ran into other ducks? No, that that was that was it. That was the only one. And, uh, but it's a memorable one. <laughs> yeah, it's <just> memorable. <laughs> and he was still a little short, big side guy that can. I mean, we worked on this in the in the weight room, and the guy had he had quads and arms. He played like he was six three though. I mean, I, I look at the games we played the the big boys, so this big USC and everybody. He stopped. He stopped. Uh, Marcus Allen, like Marcus Allen, was a little little league guy. I mean, he was he was in the backfield on wrapped around his legs, like uh, where you going, Shorty? Absolutely. I mean, when we we played them seven, I think uh, USC we tied seven seven, and they got Marcus Allen, and they got all this talent. That was a great game. I said when, that, when we stopped them off defensively. Uh, we stopped them offensively with our defense. I was pretty psyched that we could. We could. That, that's why I always praise that defense. They they don't get me back on the field, and they loved it because our offense was one of those offenses that we were not quick striking. We just drag it down that chain. We'll go third and three, get the first down. So they were sitting on the line, just sitting there going, "When I can't wait to get back in and hit." <laughs> Very nice. Well, that, that 1979 season, your first year there, stands out in the record books because of all the great players that have come to Oregon, all particularly the quarterbacks. And you, you look at dual threat guys like Achilles Smith and in more recent years, Dennis Dixon and Jeremiah Masoli. You remain the only player in Oregon history that has ever led the team in both rushing and passing in the same season. What what does that that mean to you? Knowing that of all the great quarterbacks that have played at at, at Oregon, and or, Oregon, by the way, is the number one team in the school for having, or the number one team in the country for having consecutive quarterbacks playing in the NFL. The record stretches back something like fifty years of at least having one player throw a pass in in the NFL every single year. And the next closest team is Washington, and they're half that. It's like 20, 20 to 25 years. So there's this unprecedented streak in the country of Oregon players throwing passes in the pros, which which speaks to how great, how many great quarterbacks have been at the University of Oregon. And yet of all of them, you're the only one ever that has had that has led the team in both rushing and passing in the same year. What, what does that mean to you? First of all, I'll, I'll let you know when it dawned upon me that Dan Fouts went to the University of Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, I think, it was the first uh, first spring uh, season, spring game that we had, and uh, Amar Rashad, uh, aka, <laughs> came to our spring game and got announced, and somebody said. Oh, Dan Fouts used to hand the ball off to him and throw it to him. Dan Fouts. Hmm. <laughs> you get now, now I'm like, whoa. I'm following somebody that's in the NFL. And uh, I, I had some, some funny feelings about the statistics that I had and not getting an opportunity to actually be in the NFL. And I... I see the history of quarterbacks mostly after me and the ones that were before me when you know they had leather hats and stuff, but they <laughs> Barry, you know, you still you still talk about him and and, and, and I didn't know Robinson was the head coach for um, USC had with, with the Oregon Ducks. Yep. You know, it's like it's like and we're playing against them and I thought about that and then I looked at it uh, I think the first guy that came out Playing for Atlanta that made the pros prior to me leaving the university. What was his name? Quarterback. Oh, um, uh, oh, a- a- after you left, Chris Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I said, well, I, I rode that boat. I said, yeah, that, that's a dub there, buddy. <laughs> he did there first year. 
and uh, he survived a little while. And, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden, uh, it was like one after another, and I'm like, they said, so what happened to all my friends? What happened to you? I guess I, guess I was before my time. <laughs> right, right. Well, and... <laughs> You know, keep in mind when you played the NFL game, you know, all the quarterbacks were kind of statues. You know, they, they, it was straight drop rack play, and here's a, a guy who can run. And, and it really wasn't until guys like John Elway and uh, um, Randall Cunningham got into the league that people recognized that it, the quarterback could be the. Th- I mean, there was Fran Tarkin before that, but he was kind of the exception, not the rule. So when, when you look at, at kind of the NFL now, the type of players that are there and the way that they utilize, you know, guys like Michael Vick and, uh, you know, even guys at, at Oregon, you know, Dennis Dixon and Achilles Smith. Masoli. Masoli, you know, who, who ran all, all over the place for a couple of years. Masoli is probably the best comparison as far. Yeah, yeah, I thought about that a lot. I, but he was, that was a big cookie. He's a pretty big boy, too. I, I, I didn't have the stature he had, but uh, when I looked at what he did, and a lot of days, a lot of weekends, I go, well, only he, and, and here's what we go through as quarterbacks that have their running ability. He, he's sitting there thinking about his future as an NFL quarterback, and he gets back there and he was forcing passes when he had an opportunity to run. And, and the same thing for the kid we got now. And, and that's one of the things that didn't be, I didn't, I didn't think twice about running that ball if it was open. I wasn't concerned about looking like the prototype. NFL. I wasn't selling myself to the NFL. I was trying to win for Oregon now. You know, and I, I see them sometimes apprehensive about using their athletic ability. And that's what that's what kept us afloat. I, I wasn't forcing the ball down. I mean, if it wasn't wide open, Reggie's taking off. Because I can get twenty I can get twenty yards running just as much as I can throw it for twenty. And I didn't have a very bad pat, uh, interception ratio. I didn't just throw it away every time either. So I wasn't one of those erratic guys that were doing it with the deep of the hand. And, and I used that running ability I had. And, and you know, that, that's probably one of the things that may sound undisciplinary about a quarterback with my abilities. But we won. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Day, at the end of the day, we can say we won. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, that's so true, Reggie. And you know, you uh, you played in an era that fans seem to forget. I mean, the fact is, you did have the, those two winning seasons, but be, but aside from those, fans seem to forget. I mean, because of the bad facilities, the subpar seasons, NCAA sanctions. So, what does it mean to you seeing the where the program is today, but built upon the success of what uh, you began in in your era? I'm excited. It, it, I can I can go to the you know, the park or hang out with my guys or at work and uh, say, hey, I started something. And I said, you know, it was a long time before Oregon had winning season when I got there. And uh, I don't regret one thing I did coming up at, at Oregon. And uh, I felt like I there's a lot of heritage before me. And I could say that uh, I, I contributed. Because uh, there's a lot of people in the stands who tell me the stadium's always full, but by by halftime everybody went to the to the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, you know that was the whole thing. And then now, then when I got there, there's quite a few people, both alums and uh, students and hometown people, saying we actually could stay to the game the whole game without going out and getting uh, blasted on beer. <laughs> So I mean that that was a joke that was a joke around and we had to stay in the game stay in the, uh, stay in the whole game because I was playing so that was pretty pretty exciting to get those type of compliments from people that had has been diehard Oregon fans forever. Uh, absolutely. Well, you know. The 1980 season, uh, your senior year, was interesting for uh, a couple reasons. One, that you know there was the whole you know, NCA issues and you know crap about ineligibility and all that. But there's a funny little twist on that in that the schedule had been reworked a, a little bit. The the ads wanted to have the Stanford game come first in the season to. Uh, Thinking that that they could get some TV exposure that that way of you know the the Stanford team that year had Darren Nelson and it had John Elway and and the the prospect of well let's have Elway versus Ogburn and you know the the TV you know the TV stations would want to show that so they bump Stanford up to week one and then all, all the NCA crap comes down and you end up being ruled ineligible 
for the Stanford game. And the the rest of the Pac-10, all the coaches immediately started screaming foul, not not about the fact that the, the sentence had been reduced, but the fact that Stanford is the only team that doesn't get to play against Reggie Ogburn. <laughs> <laughs> like, and all, when we're speaking of the year before that, we beat them. Yeah. And then uh, Elway becomes, he's now the starting quarterback. Uh, I'll really tell you the truth, that is one sick piece of place in my stomach that I had to watch him. Because, see, the whole theory was I wasn't going to let him on the field. That We're going to go ball control. We're going to run six yards, four yards, first down. And he wasn't going to see the field. And that's a guy, God bless him, because he's good. He's I think I, as a team player, I was better than him. Individually, he had a great arm. But that would have been nice on my resume to have beaten John Elway. But, uh, yeah, that was very sickening. And I, I didn't know if to think that was uh, politically done. <laughs> <laughs> I have my own thoughts about that one. Or it just happened that way. But I, I looked at him for years in the NFL and go, you lucky son of a gun. <laughs> you, could been, you, could, you could have been a notch in my uh, my baseball bat saying I beat you in high in our college. So right. Got away with it. And, and, and Luck, you got to remember now, we, Kevin and Kevin Luck didn't do a bad job that game. Mm-hmm. He just he scored too quickly and he kept Elway back. I and mean, it, it was a high scoring game for the most part. Yeah, it was thirty five twenty five final score. So I mean, that, that was a yeah, good. Luck could Luck laid it back on the field because. We went to our running, our passing game. Plus, ran a few options to keep him honest, but he utilized his throwing ability, and uh, we kept scoring too fast, and we kept coming back out on the field and driving him down, and pretty soon you wear your defense out. And that's, that's, and I tell you, that's one of the things that can hurt you. If you they always talk about in the NFL now, you need a running game because you can't have, you can't keep, who's that uh, firepower guy? He comes in, he throws down the field every five minutes, he's up. Uh, What's his name? He does it very well, too. Now he's with Denver. Um, oh, does he, he, he keeps his defense on the field. You can't score too bad. They need a break. Yeah. Well, I don't know. The, these days, Oregon kind of makes a living out of doing that, though. <laughs> Sco- scoring yeah, but, scoring like 30 seconds I'm flat. Alioli. I look at Alioli, and he's, he knows that. So he's got a, he's got a, 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 a depth on his uh, defense knowing that he's got to rotate defensive players because they're going to be out there all day because the offense is going to score every two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, from the fan perspective, it's a lot of fun to watch, though I'm I'm sure, uh, you know, some of those defensive guys at times would be like, man, can we slow it down just a little bit? <laughs> you know? Yeah, the ones who fake their injuries make that obvious. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you go off the field, you turn around, you douse yourself with a Gatorade, next thing you're back on the field again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that... Um, getting back to that 1980 season, after that that loss to to Stanford, um, one thing that I noticed a, a, about the roster, looking at the rivalry games, you know, I, in, at Oregon, everything kind of revolves around Oregon State and Washington, and you 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 beat the Beavers in both years with, that you play, which is fantastic. But you lost to Washington in '79. How good was it to come back to go, go to Seattle? And beat down the Huskies as badly as you did, getting revenge for the previous season. And I got to add to that, um, they didn't win again until 1995, another 15 years, till we won at in Seattle. Well, first of all, the game that we played them in 79, when they beat us, the whistle blew. We had an option play. It was uh, 29, or uh, 28. I put it in... Uh, Vince Williams' stomach pulled it out, and uh, the whistle blew, and I stopped. And the cornerback continued and dropped right on my knee, and that's when I got the uh, cartilage tear in my uh, right knee. Oh, that I that I feel to this day right now, and it gets a little cold in, in Florida, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could I could tell you when it's gonna rain. <laughs> <laughs> the arthritis is set in there, but yeah, going back up there. It was a lot of revenge on my behalf, personally, because they took me out. It was almost, I think, the first or second quarter. And then I tried to go back in, but my knee wouldn't allow me. And that entire year, I continued 
to not be able to practice full until about Tuesday or Wednesday because my knee would just swell. And I didn't find I had torn cartilage until after that first year. So going back up there to play them, only thing I can think about is they made it very unbearable for me for my, for my first year at the University of Oregon in terms of having uh, not being able to practice five days a week. Hmm. Okay. Well, and it it is interesting in that uh, you know that that knee injury because of it. Uh, I, I assume that means that you weren't able to run as much, but you still put up almost as many rushing yards as you did in '79. Well, how much of a hindrance was it come game day? No, that that injury it, it was swell. After I come Tuesday, I was perfectly fine. The swelling went down. I had total mobility. And then after game day, it would blow up like a balloon. I mean, I would play. It wasn't. I didn't have to get any type of injections. I just had to make sure I did my treatments and my leg lifts and get the uh, old war, war pool going on it and ice it and take it through hot cold treatments uh, each day after practice. So I, it was bearable, and it didn't affect me as much during that year to play game after game as it did when. Uh, so here's the other story. I didn't get operated into it in time for uh, scouts to come by for the part of my senior year. Mm -hmm. And that's when I did my 40 times for all the NFL scouts. Oh. Right after surgery. Mm -hmm. So, and I had an ex coach that said, I really don't want to do this thing with these guys because that's the record they're going to have. And I'm really not ready to go. So, I didn't even go through spring ball that hard because I was getting ready for the following year. Interesting. Well, during your time in Oregon, uh, you, as far as the the big rivals go, you went three out of four. You know the the only blemish is the '79 loss to Washington, but the way you beat them down in 1980 and you beat down the the Beavers both times, it, it, is that a, an extra little badge of pride that you carry with you? The fact that you took down Oregon's rivals so handily each time. Yeah, because that's what we always talked about. You, it was just certain games you had to win. It was the bragging yeah. right. You know, Michigan State, they beat us the one year in the first year, and you could almost get away with losing against Michigan State because technically everybody thought they were a better team than us. But after that first year, and we almost went to a bowl game, just shy of it, the confidence level of all the team, team players just shot to the roof. So the following year, going into my senior year, it was like robbery, it doesn't matter. We, we felt like we were just as good as any team that we were going to play. But, yeah, it was a prerequisite to win those rivalries. Uh, anybody you play in the Pac-10 or Oregon State or Washington or the Huskies, uh, we were psyched out. I mean, Coach Brooks and, and all the coaching staff, they had that gleam of look like this is for the Northwest in the West Coast bragging rights, we had to win them. Right. Well, that that eighty season too. There's some wins and games that definitely stand out. You know, we talked about the Stanford one that that you couldn't play in, but the Washington win was big. Certainly, you got your revenge on Michigan State in a in a big way. Uh, and then the the tie against USC that you mentioned before, when they had Marcus Allen on, on their team, that that's big. Is there a particular game that stands out to you as your personal favorite? over your, your time as a duck? Yeah, I'd have to say uh, the UCLA game down in the Coliseum. Uh, a lot of a lot of the people that I went to school with at uh, College of the Canyons, uh, I had met a lot of guys down. I had a kid that followed me. I was his, uh, I was his hero. And... Uh, he, when I got there, he, he had been following me so much. He gave me a scrapbook at the game that he showed me that he's been pulling articles on me all the time. But uh, that UCLA game, UCLA game against uh, Kenny Easley and uh, McNeil and uh, Ramsey, you know, that was one of the things I wanted to show because he was touted as going to the NFL. He had that 6'2 brain. And I was just five nine and a half in the program five ten, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to show in front of that crowd that uh, Oregon was where the place to go. And not only that, 
they wanted me to go to running back, and I wanted to show them that I, you should have took me. I wanted to make them <laughs> think about it. And that was Donahue at the time. Mm-hmm. Which is, a, I think, another Oregon grad, isn't he? Yep, yes, he was. And John McKay and, I mean, all sorts of coaching legends going all the way back to the early days of Hugo Bezdek. So, I mean, Oregon, it's weird. It's been a crossroads of coaching knowledge. And it's something that that we've written about on on our site, actually, the fact that you wouldn't think sleepy little Eugene would be such an epicenter of coaching. But just about every big name over the past hundred years, at one point or another, their path has somehow led through Eugene, Oregon, of all places. So it's it's a testament to the, the the type of people that are there and just the the importance that they put in in uh, you know educating people on the game and you know how things work. Um, let, let, let's talk about your your post Oregon career because you did go into the USFL for a little bit and then you went into the CFL and I know you wanted a shot at the NFL but you know maybe the the knee and and your height you know, they immediately, you know, cast you aside and said, well, we're not even going to give this guy a shot. What what are your memories of, of trying to be a pro and kind of the differences between, you know, the college game and the pro game for you? Well, again, uh, when I went to, uh, like a fish out of water when I got, got to Canada, Bill's, there's no exaggerating. That Canadian feel is why. <laughs> it feels like, Sideline to sideline is like goalpost to goalpost. So that, that was a shock to me. And going there and lasting a couple of preseason games and then get an opportunity to go to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for a tryout, still at quarterback. Then they moved me to defensive back. That's when I came to the conclusion that I was going to be a skilled position. And being the athlete I was, I adapted pretty good. And I can tell you right now, I had one episode where I'd been on a down and out, and I thought I had the interception. And there's an old technique that you use your inside arm to knock the ball down, and you take your outside arm and hang around, hang it around the guy's hip in case you missed the ball. Well, I did it vice versa, and the guy went up the sideline in practice. And I guess they figured, hmm, he's a little too risky. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Then I came, that's when I came back to Eugene. And I said, you know, let me go ahead and see, seize the opportunity because I was well liked and known, get my career going and get a job up here. And that was 1980 when the uh, interest rates went to the roof and the economy got kind of bad up there because of, nobody was building homes and the lumber industry started going down. And I took a job as a uh, loan officer, and management trained loan officer at the local bank. I want to call it a U.S. bank that was there at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, I'm not an office guy. <laughs> and, uh, Coach uh, Whitmark said, hey, man, you still want to play? I said, yeah, Coach. He goes, the best man in my wedding is the offensive coordinator for the Oakland Raiders. I took that little Audi 100 LS I had and drove down to uh, Oakland and uh, stayed there until the last cut. I went through about five roommates that 5 o'clock knock on the door. Right. I'll never forget that. That 5 o'clock knock on the door will sing. It, 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 will, it will give you an upset stomach because you don't know. You know you got a roommate in there, but you're wondering which one it is. And I went through five of those guys. And that sixth morning, that sixth time, toward the end of the season. Matter of fact, uh, what's his name? Uh, Chester Raymond, Raymond Chester, uh, the Goose, uh, Hendricks, all of them on the sideline during preseason telling me, hey, little man, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Because they had all finally moved me to uh, wide receiver. Mm-hmm. And uh, Whitmark's best man is right. I forget his name right now. He tells me, hey, you going to throw for me today? I mean, in practice, I was just showing out. I was doing it. I was making it happen. So now the veterans are telling me I'm going to make it. But they didn't know the financial situation. And I, I, I know now that it's a true business. Mm-hmm. That they had too much money invested in people that had signed already. I came in as a free agent. And... Uh, 
they really had no no loyal to me at the time. So they told me to go down to San Francisco and play for this <laughs> to play for this semi team and if they needed me they'd call me back up. When I get to the semi team in San Francisco, guess who I'm running into? Rock Richmond. He's playing for. <laughs> you remember Rock Richmond? I, I don't know. The punt returner played cornerback for us with Mike. Oh, okay. Uh, he's playing with his semi team, and I'm going, okay. So I'm sleeping on his couch. Now I go from being this highly talented athlete to sleeping on a couch. No job. I'm just sitting here for a couple of weeks thinking Oakland's going to call me back. Well, they never did, and I told the uh, the guy who owned the construction company, semi protein guy. I said, guy, I need I need a job. I got a be self-supportive here. I, and he goes, I just hired the last position I had. I said, well, you just lost the, lost me because I'm going home. <laughs> Very nice, I, man. I drove from there all the way across country. I stopped by and saw, uh, you remember, remember Jackson that played wide receiver for me? I do, yes. He lived in Idaho. I stopped over there and stayed a week with him. I had a classmate that stayed in uh, Aurora, California. I stayed with him for a week, and I finally made it to Atlanta where uh, one of my studious friends, not an athlete, that I used to study with, Rick, uh, his name was uh, Slade, Rick Slade. So I stayed with him a week in Atlanta. He was selling machines. And then I, my last stop was Orlando, Florida, and that's where I ended up playing... Uh, Getting into the uh, the uh, new league that they had, which was uh, called what's the name of that league that came up? Um, the, the the USFL. Yeah, the USFL. And guess who was my coach? No uh, idea. Oregon State's uh, father. The guy played receiver for Oregon State, and his father was a coach up in uh, Portland for a little bit. Oh, uh, uh, Mouse Davis? No, not Davis. Uh, I was playing with the uh, Breeze, the, the Breezers. Uh, that's the team I was trying out for. Because all the teams are located down in, in, in Orlando. The uh, Philadelphia Breeze. That's where he was the head coach at. But I think his name out there about two days from now. His son ended up being the assistant coach for him. Hmm. Anyway, that lasted, that lasted about three weeks. So they had Herschel Walker, all of Everybody and their mother that was out of the game for a little while came back to play. And uh, that lasted about three weeks, and I just came on home. Hmm. So, you know, lo looking back at, at your time in, in Oregon during the, those two years, the time preceding, I mean, Oregon hadn't gone to a bowl game since 1963 and Oregon would end up not going to a bowl game until 1989. And certainly there's arguments to be made that during those those six-win seasons back-to-back, -back, that uh, the way that you elevated the program from just two-win seasons up to six, that not only were you deserving of maybe being a Pac-10 MVP or a, a team MVP, but possibly even a Pac-10 MVP for the way that, that you were carrying the team and making Oregon you know, a force in, in the conference. Could you recognize the the sense of pride and enthusiasm that was being injected into the city and the program as a whole because of the success that the Ducks were suddenly having on the field in 79 and 80? Yeah, I, I saw that happen in front of my eyes. You know, the enthusiasm and it's just the emotion in general about, about the university uh, athletic program in general. And you know, I, I did I did get recognized as uh, a player of the year in the Pac-10. I ended up getting a Conquistor Award uh, that year. Both Steve Greatwood and myself, uh, running back that played for Stanford, little short guy that went on to play to Minnesota. Oh, Darren Nelson. Yeah, and. Uh, What's his name was there? It was Bonnie Lott. It was a pretty big deal. I did get recognized as that, but uh, that's 
Pac-10 player that we about you know three four times a year. I didn't. I didn't get too hung up on because I thought it was going to happen for me. I didn't get too hung up on not getting what I thought I deserved. And I, I never felt like anybody really owed me anything because I felt more or less it was a blessing to have the opportunity that I had. First of all, to be able to play the game that I love, and and second of all, go in on a scholarship and have the opportunity to graduate. So I, I didn't feel the animosity of not getting what I deserved. You know, there's, a, there's another story when it got to the next level and how the NFL worked. But mm-hmm. from a university standpoint, or even a practice, I, I didn't feel like I was shortchanged on any opportunities or any accolades that that should have came to me. You know, I, do Do you think that that maybe um, some of the uh, the NCAA probationary things kind of put a little stigma on it that maybe prevented you, hindsight now, from being able to get some of that stuff or a shot at the NFL where you know how so often, you know, they, they look at one thing and that sort of defines them. Like, like you know, LeGarrette Blunt playing in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, probably first or second round talent. He went undrafted based on one moment and teams just kind of focused on one moment and they forget you know the person as a whole and their entire body of work when you know oh well he's the guy who punched someone and every time you watch a tampa bay buccaneers it takes about five minutes before they mention that oh well he's the guy who punched someone. it's like that's permanently tattooed on his forehead do you think maybe that the whole ncaa thing in 1980 might have done the same thing for you back then oh without a doubt first first of all you know you take a guy like blunt he's got to be on paper, he's a, he's a picture perfect running back at the NFL one. Then you take a guy like me that came associated with the, you know, the sanctions. And you know, that's something I always understood too is that. I mean, I don't know if they do it now, but they were. You had to take psychological tests, and when you start talking about going into an organization, they want to know who's your mother, who's your daddy. I mean, you hear it on NFL TV. There's nobody's safe life is sacred to what their their childhood background was. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and yes, that could have had some bearing on it. And because I think if that hadn't happened with the amount of publicity and the, the way our team did win, we probably would. Could you, you take a look at Hinkle? You, you take a look at. Uh, Goldsmith. Mike and Walter. Greg, and... Greg, yeah, Greg Wood had an opportunity to play. Uh, we had several guys on the offensive line and defense that had an opportunity to go up. So it, it didn't take much to kind of push me under the carpet and go, well, you know. Right, there, there's that, this one incident and that defines you. I'm already a question mark with my height. And I, I wasn't running blistering four one forty, so yeah, that had something to do with it. And, you know, he, then Coach Brooks, you know, he, he never let me waver. Me and him had to talk about the NFL and my next level, and he goes, "I can never promise you you're going to be in the NFL. It's one thing we have to do, though. We're going to make sure Reggie Osborne graduates from college." And that's when he had Barbara Walters was the uh, that was her name. Barbara Walters was our uh, uh, counselor for the entire team, and she she always looked and talked with teachers about our grades. So uh, I had a mom and her to make sure that I was getting my lesson. <laughs> Very nice, man. Well, okay, kind of you know, advantage being hindsight. There, there's uh, just a, a couple things that we want to wrap this up on, and one is that. You know, a lot of memories fade over time, and certainly, uh, you know, when you get back to Oregon uh, this fall, you, you'll see it that the the common saying is, "Well, Oregon football didn't start until 1994," and, and so why should fans look back on the years that you played at, at Oregon? Why should people remember Reggie Ogburn, and why should people remember the, the 79 and 80 seasons? Uh, I, I say. If it wasn't a Reggie Ogburn in 80, 79 and 80, the recruiting gates would have never opened for the University of Oregon. I mean, uh, when I saw the talent that they started getting after I had left, I felt, I felt 
sense of very of pride that you know kind of put them out there to let kids know that there's an opportunity. You know, you, you, first of all, you got to say, okay, successful black quarterback. I mean, we, I mean, everybody knew who I was, and then you get the other kids that want to come to school. There. You got people like Callum that was successful. That was from Los Angeles, from Southern California. He goes back home and talks. You know, you don't have to necessarily talk to everybody. Saying, "How's Oregon? How's Oregon?" You know. So, with that said, hey, I feel like I was a, a catalyst in in, in in helping put him up in, in in front of people to say, "I think I might go there." Hmm. You know. In the, in the past, and you know, everybody's going to University of Oregon. When I call back home and say, I'm going to University of Oregon, what's there? Hmm. And it's a great environment. <laughs> education. It's, it, back then, there was no partying to do, so I knew I was going to go to, go to class. I didn't have to worry about hanging out down in Los Angeles like I did when I was in junior college. So uh, I'm going to go to school. I'm going here to go to school. And I was the second in my grandfather's. Uh, family to graduate from school, my uncle and myself, my youngest uncle. So <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what I would say is football started because I didn't go there because Dan Faust was the coach, uh, the quarterback. I went there because I saw an opportunity to, first of all, to start and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And then 94, I guess they have a they have an argument too, because either you win it all or you don't win win it all. We didn't win it all, but we had a good time winning what we did win. So right, well, in uh, looking at the program today, you know Chip Kelly's offense utilizing quarterbacks to get into open space and be able to run and doing all these option fakes and everything. Personally, as a fan, remembering watching you when I was a very little kid, I can't help sometimes, particularly when Jeremiah Masoli was playing at Oregon, I'm sure you watched a lot of games with him, just thinking, man, what could Reggie Ogburn do in this offense? <laughs> so to, from, from, the, the, from the, the man himself, what do you think you could do in the type of system that Oregon is running now? I could tell you is it'd be like a, it'd be like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> it really would. I, I I I just get the hairs on my arms stand up when I watch those games. I mean that offense is so dynamic. And then you just look at it, it's like you know, most of my plays were straight out. Reggie's gonna run it was a straight out sprint right, straight out sprint left or quarterback draw. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there wasn't too much deception when I ran the ball. You know, and then I look at the exception that they, that's there now, and I, and I see whether it was Mazzoli or whomever or Thomas. I mean, the way that offense designed, they're white. They're out there on an the island by themselves. There's the fake in there. He's a mastermind. That coach is a mastermind. I, nobody runs that offense like he does. Uh, the, the play calling, the, the way they execute it. I've seen some remnants of it out through some other teams, but the way he executes that and they play, they win those plays. Anybody else is just a mimic of it. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Well, um, can we get a little bit of a where where are they now thing to kind of get a quick update on uh, Reggie Ogburn's life after uh, you know after you hung up the cleats. Yeah, what do you do these days, and um, what what do you like the best about uh, what your time at Oregon made you into the man who you are today? Uh, no doubt. Um, coming back home, um, I tried to sell some life insurance, be a manager for Wendy's, and I ended up working at UPS for about nine months. And I'll tell you, I got into management after those nine months because of the college degree I had. The, the education definitely opened the door there, and I worked there for 15 years in the transportation business for them as a manager. And uh, along with that, I, I've been in the transportation business ever since. Worked for FedEx. Now I work 
working for a freight company, Saia Motor Freight, S-A-I-A Motor Freight. Uh, I'm in charge of everything from uh, in South Florida. So here I am again, people working for me. I'm leading people and directing people and setting an example to do the right thing. So a lot of that was a tribute to the education and my athletic uh, straw that I had at uh, Oregon. Just being a leader right now. Um, I love it. Uh, instant results in the transportation business. When you go home, you know you did a good job and you didn't, just like a game. At the end of the game, you either know you won or you lost. And that's what's so in common with the transportation business. Each day is different, but you know if you did the job or not at the end of the day. Fantastic. Well, do you have any other questions? Or I think I'm good. Well, besides that, um, you know, I I think I'm pretty good too, Reggie. But um, uh, just when when you do plan to come back here to Oregon, uh, is there any special like place you would want to visit? Like, for example, any restaurant that that might still be in business that you love to hang out at, or uh, any place, any kind of thing that you would like to take a walk down memory lane, or place. I want to go. I want to go to 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 the. Uh club that we had on campus and get a picture and I want my own picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. What do we call it? Duffies, I think it was. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. the, these I'm, days, I'm, I'm, the, some of the spots some of the spots that are still around that you might remember are uh, Max's Tavern is still there. Rennie's. And Rennie's is still there. And I, I don't recall if Taylor's was open back when, when you were there, but those are kind of the big three spots. That was me hanging out with the offensive linemen uh, in the evenings or on the weekend off season. Off season, and um, they were big boys, so they got a picture, and I'm sitting there trying to hang with them, little Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, what I want to do is when I get there, I want to I want to go up uh, and see the Willamette River, and uh, I did a trail on one of the uh, mountains one time, one of the smaller mountains. I want to do that. And one of the things I really enjoyed about Eugene when I was there was being able to get up. That's why I never stayed there doing off season. I didn't come home. Getting up early in the morning and going on a jogging path and just having an inhaling time and smelling good air while I'm jogging. That that was awesome. Very nice, man. Well, we'll be looking forward to uh, Reggie Ogburn's triumphant return to Eugene. Um, uh October when uh, the Washington game's taking place. Definitely. And I just and I just dug out those videos. My daughter decided to rearrange my uh library. <laughs> they they get they get especially football season. Mm-hmm. I, I could I can really start it going, Boy, I think I can still do it. <laughs> they, 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 they get kinda they get kinda crazy around here. They they call me old man thinking I can run the ball still. So they kind of hit my videos. I found them. Fantastic. Well, get get, get those in the mail. Once I get them in hand, I'll convert them to DVDs for you. And we'll also make sure that some of that footage ends up online so that fans can appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, one other thing, Reggie, speaking of your daughter, um, tell tell us really quickly about your family. Um, How old are your kids? Uh, Tell tell us about your family just real quick and how long, uh, you know. Been married 28 years. Okay. Uh, my daughter just turned 26 on uh, oh. this past month. Uh, she's a graduate of Central Florida. My wife uh, graduates this uh, Saturday with oh. her PhD. Awesome. So she's been very edu- an educated family. I only have one kid, and that's my daughter, 26 years old. Uh, been with my wife uh, for 28, so... Uh, both of us, uh, I can say, uh, know the importance of education. We want to make sure she did. And my wife's been working for the school board for the last 26 years. Uh, she's the director of uh, human resource for the uh, Broward County School Board. And uh, where did you meet her? Uh, quite honestly, best friend in high school. When I got back home, I was, I was all... You, you got to, it's been just a, a, an 
emotional high for me my whole life because in the high school I was, I did what I did at Oregon. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of my best friends, uh, sister, uh, four, four years older than her, I came back home and I went to his house. We started reminiscing and his sister walked across the hallway. I go, who is that? He goes, that's just sis. <laughs> I go, oh, she done growed up. So we ended up falling in love. Oh, cool. And we got married and... Uh, I said, you're still going to be my best friend, right? <laughs> <laughs> so her father knew me from high school. So he always said she was very, she went to private school most of her life. And uh, she was happy to, that she met somebody that was responsible, I guess. And uh, it, it's been a beautiful life. I haven't had any regrets about it. I, quite obviously, uh I sure like to make the money I'm making right now to play every weekend on Sunday. But, uh, well, I can name one regret, and that's not coming back to Eugene since 1982. <laughs> well, you haven't been here in my life, my entire lifetime, Reggie. You haven't even been here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm coming back. All right. Well, I, I think we we have more than enough to be able to put together a great article here. So, Reggie, we cannot thank you enough for this time. This is going to turn out great. Be sure to get those tapes in the mail. I'll have them converted. I'll send them right back to you, and uh, we'll we'll let you know when the article comes out. We'll do it. I'll get those off for sure this week. Fantastic. Hey, thanks, Reggie. Thank you, I appreciate you. Great. We appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Have a, have a great day, man. It's been awesome talking okay. to you. Take care. Bye.